Hi there, everybody, and welcome to episode 307 of The Art of Procurement with me, the host, Philip Eidson. With a number of our podcasts, they receive listens many months and even years after they are published, which means that we often don't refer to current events outside of our This Month in Procurement pod. So today's podcast is published right in the middle of March 2020 as the world continues to come to grips with the rapid spread of COVID-19. And I wanted to acknowledge that right at the start of today's episode and of course, wish you good health. And like many of you, I'm sure we're taking things here day to day. You know, I think we're looking towards week to week um, at this point, but we felt it's also important to continue to publish insightful conversations that have been recorded over the past couple of months. My team and I here at Art of Procurement, we are definitely here to support you really in any way that we can over the coming weeks and months. Last week, we had our first office hours, which we're actually going to be looking to do again in the next week or so. And we're going to be emailing you as we partner with a number of organizations to offer ways in which you can support your organization, the customers of your organization, and your most vulnerable suppliers. So watch this space for that as we're just putting together a a number of different ways that we think will really enable procurement professionals to be a part of the solution for their organizations. We're jumping into today's podcast. I'm joined by Rich Ham. Rich is the CEO of Finetune, an expense reduction company that focuses on a small number of what they call nuisance categories, such as uniforms, pest control, and waste disposal. And today we deep dive into the uniforms category. It's a category that on the outside, you know, when you're going through an analysis of your entire spend, it may not be one that jumps off the page or looks particularly complex. But in my experience, it's one of the most personal and sensitive categories of spend that procurement will ever address. It ranks up there with corporate travel and cafeteria services as a category that really has wide reaching impact across your employee base. And where... The organizational perception of procurement and categories like this really can be won and lost. And so today we deep dive into uniforms where Rich provides a look into the dynamics of the industry and shares actions that procurement leaders can take to maximize their impact while maintaining a happy workforce. I start the conversation like I always try and do when I'm talking to a procurement practitioner or someone who's been around procurement for a long time, if Rich found procurement or if procurement found him. I was a journalism and political science major in college. And so I, I certainly didn't go seeking <laughs> procurement. And in right. fact, I, I probably uh, didn't know what procurement was until, uh, you know, I was uh, a working professional uh, accidentally finding it. Um, but even, you know, I think I should provide a bit of a caveat to my answer here, which is even now, I don't think of what I do or what fine tune does as being um, procurement, so to speak. I think of us as, as operating um, in expense management Mm -hmm. and, and of procurement being one element of what we do, but because of the, the nature of the expenses, that we are so deeply immersed in um, pro- procurement uh, is is an element, but effective management of these expenses requires uh, a much more nose to tail holistic approach. And so, um, I don't day to day. I don't think of fine tune as being you know in in procurement to be honest. But I I certainly. Uh, I certainly didn't find it. It definitely found me. It's it's an interesting question that you raise about, you know, what is procurement? Not something we're going to solve for here. But, you know, when you think traditionally, um, you know, it is more of that, let's just look at the cost out. And we talk about this a lot on the show, you know, how procurement is evolving and, and we're trying to... Um, to help evolve, frankly, to a, an end-to-end, you know, cradle to grave, look at the entire commercial value of something that you buy versus it just being what's the cost. And so it sounds like what you're doing is, is really that you are looking at where do, where do these categories fit commercially for the clients that you work with um, and what are all the different levers. And yes, one of those levers can be cost, but there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and we've, you know, we, where we've found ourselves, I don't think that I, I fully understood, or at least I didn't have a working title for it at the time we started the business back in early 2002. Um, I had just left a job with, with Cintas, the industry leader in the uniform rental space. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I knew that I thought that the 
consulting model would be uh, effectively applied to that expense because I felt that it was an expense that took up more time than it was worth. Um, over time, we've come to uh, see that the tie that binds the areas that we specialize in um, is is that it's okay. that the, this this subset of indirect expenses where the relationship between monetary priority and management time is an unhealthy one that, that where that relationship's all out of whack and we've we've over I think it was around 2010 or so where we decided we're gonna we're gonna call these expenses nuisance expenses mm -hmm. and we don't mean that as a we don't mean that as a shot at the suppliers we just mean that you know by the by the very nature of the expense that it it, it tends to be the kinds of expenses that um, that erode uh, an expense management professional's ability to remain mission focused um, and tends to distract attention from from higher priorities. And so, um, you know, yeah, that's the kind of expense we specialize in today. Um, and uh, we call them nuisance expenses. What kind of expense categories then would fall under nuisance? You mentioned uniform, you like your background being in uniforms and uniform rental. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on uh, in the podcast. But what are the categories kind of fall under that nuisance term? Well, if you think of everything that a, uh, an indirect buyer might be responsible for as falling somewhere on a spectrum from simple widgets to complex services, I certainly think that um, what the expenses we refer to as nuisance expenses are going to you're going to find those out at the complex service end of the spectrum. Yeah. They're going to be the kinds of expenses that are replete with uh, moving parts, uh, nooks and crannies, uh, you know, discretionary uh, charges and practices on the supplier side. Um, you know, the highly complex, typically service oriented expenses. Not to say that there, you're not going to find widgets that, that actually really are complex and entail a great many variables, um, but I think as a general rule, the expenses we're talking about are, are out at that complex service end of the spectrum, frequently multi-year service contract expenses. Um, and you know, while we started in uniform, we were, you know, when we were talking to our clients in the early years of the business, we, were, we kept asking, what are other expenses that meet similar criteria? Um, and by 2009, we were launching in earnest into the waste and recycling arena because our clients kept telling us that that was an expense that felt very similar to them as the, the uniform rental space. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just last year, we launched uh, into the pest control industry as a, as a third kind of official fine tune offering. And we've, we've done projects in other spaces that are not uh, part of our official offering as of today, at least that we would market as as an area that we have deep expertise in, but yeah. certainly industrial gases, uh, equipment rental, a handful of other uh, expenses seem to fit the bill. But as of today, we're we're deeply immersed in uniform rental, waste and recycling, and and pest control because they've all fit the uh, fit under that umbrella of nuisance expenses very neatly, and as such, seem to be optimal for for third party management. So let's talk a little bit about uniforms. You know, it's one of those categories that. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, to manage teams who are managing that category, and it can turn pretty ugly pretty quickly um, if you aren't doing the right thing and if you're not taking into account the needs of ultimately the users of those uniforms. Now, before we go into kind of the tips and the tricks and what the market looks like and how to maximize the opportunity in the category, I wonder if you could just kind of talk a little bit about what does this category of uniforms actually entail? Well, um, from a market standpoint, uh, you know, you're talking about something in the neighborhood of a $16 billion uh, industry in the U.S. You've, uh, it's, the, the big move in recent years has been the industry leader, Cintas, um, bought one of the four uh, leading national players, G&K Services, a few years back in the last couple of years has um, last three years has, has seen their assimilation of that, uh, the largest mm -hmm. acquisition in the industry's history into their uh, enterprise. So you're now, you've got three national players that, you know, collectively represent uh, maybe 55, 60% of, of revenue nationwide. And then you've got, you know, a, a layer of regional players beneath those and some mom and pops around the country. But certainly, uh, the regionals and mom and pop landscape have 
they've been gradually assimilated into the mm-hmm. uh, the three big nationals: Centas, Aramark, and Unifers. It's a it's a story that you'll of course find in nearly any industry. But you know that's that's the landscape, and and uh, our focus. These companies don't only do uniform rental. And to right. be clear, for anybody who's not anyone in your audience who's not familiar with um, what's going on, when you see a Sintas or an Aramark truck driving around on the streets, that 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 truck is providing a service that ultimately revolves around uh, renting, typically renting clothing to their their customers, uh, taking that clothing back to uh, their laundering facilities on a weekly basis cleaning that stuff and bringing it back clean the next week, picking up the dirty stuff and doing it again mm-hmm. over the, the, the term of multi-year contracts. And so, you know, that's, that's the core of the industry. They certainly all have direct sale uh, apparatus uh, as, as part of their, their offering. They, they sell uniforms that they manufacture as well. Um, and, and most of the suppliers in the space have other diversified offerings from first aid and safety to fire protection uh, you know, to various other facility service offerings, restroom products, et cetera. But, but at its core and certainly fine-tuned focus is the, the, the renting and laundering of uniforms. Mm-hmm. Now, from a market perspective, you have three major players, you know, making up, I think you said 60% plus of the market. Does that mean that from a, um, a power dynamic perspective, there is a lot of power on the side of the providers because it's a pretty um, consolidated market? Yeah, well, this is this has really um, been the major change of the last few years, and it's um, it's certainly conspiring to make life even more difficult on uh, on buyers of these services for you know for a period of multiple decades uh, until just recently. Market pricing throughout the industry for core products uh, was alternating between flat and on a downward trajectory. Um, and certainly that was partly owing to the fact that, um, you know, technological advances, advancements at the plant level were, um, you know, the suppliers were finding efficiencies and finding mm-hmm. ways to get more competitive. But, but a good deal of the story was it was just a bloodbath um, in terms of a market share battle with four viable national alternatives while G&K was still in the mix. Um, combined with a host of viable regional players, you know, there was just a long-term uh, fight for, for market share. And it's only just in the, in the recent wake of this uh, G&K acquisition by Cintas that, um, that there has been, I would say, uh, an industry-wide focus on um, kind of reclaiming profitability. Yeah. And so it is, not, it is not at present a favorable market um, for customers to find savings the old-fashioned way um, by going to market and squeezing, squeezing for unit cost right. savings. Now, the, the, as a side note, that never really worked well to begin <laughs> with as it pertains to this space. But a, a buyer might think they were accomplishing, you know, their goal of cost savings by by going to the market and identifying y- unit cost savings, implementing a new and better agreement, you know, throwing the contract over the wall. Um, and then, you know, maybe realizing a few years later, it didn't quite pan out the way it was supposed to. But now even that lever um, is not nearly so available to customers as the suppliers that find themselves digging in their heels a little more um, from a cost standpoint. So you really do the at present in, in this uh, when it comes to managing uniform rental you just are forced to look for other uh, avenues mm-hmm. um, to pursue cost savings because the, the market isn't bearing what it has over the last 20 or 30 years. Now, the, the uniforms category itself, you know, it's a really personal category. It's one of those things like um, corporate travel, I would always think of, you know, where mm-hmm. it's the, the users of the, the product, the service that's being bought, you know, have a very... Um, they have a very strong opinion of the quality of what it is that they're uh, what they're getting. You know, obviously in uniforms, it's people who are wearing these things all day, every day for, you know, yeah, uh, forty eight weeks of the year in some cases. Um, h- how do you balance the needs with the stakeholders of, of the stakeholders? You know, the people who are wearing those uniforms with you know some of the more traditional procurement techniques, let's say, because 
you know, you, you can go and you can go and look at, well, we're going to go and uh, rent a uniform that, and I'm just making a number up. Let's say it's a, a $10 uniform versus a $20 uniform. And those numbers probably have no bearing on the reality, but just to illustrate, um, you know, because in procurement, you don't need to worry about what that $10 uniform feels like. Um, how are you balancing those things together? Well, it, you're, you're hitting on a, a critical, critical element of being a good manager of this category, which is understanding that biases in the field. And if, uh, if, if you consider, you know, some combination of your field buyers and field operators and, and field personnel and ultimately end users to be your customers uh, as the procurement executives, um, you know, I'm hard pressed to think of other expenses where the biases are going to be quite this strong for exactly the reasons that you referenced. We're mm -hmm. talking about the clothing that people are going to wear um, day in, day out. And so, you know, my advice to a buyer who is new to the category, even if they're, you know, um, impeccably experienced when it comes to procurement um, would be to, you know, exercise great caution <laughs> when it comes to uh, pursuing uh, consolidation uh, or uh, centralizing the expense. Mm -hmm. This is not an expense that lends itself necessarily very well to uh, a nationwide single supplier approach for a large organization with, with, you know, operations spread throughout the country. It's not to say that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. um, but, but step one, you know, really needs to be before you go pursuing anything in the open market, you know, understand the biases of your people in the field and proceed with caution <laughs> because right. it, it is an expense that can absolutely backfire uh, tremendously on a buyer that uh, that fails uh, to, to undertake that step. It's yeah, the, the emotions run high when it comes yeah. to uniforms. If you want to think about, you know, the, the perception of procurement generally, this is one of those categories I feel where, you know, perceptions at the executive level about procurement are formed in... Uh, corridor conversations of, you know, you want plant managers, warehouse managers, store managers, um, you know, office managers where a uniform is mandated, wherever it be. If you want all those people to com be complaining to the senior leadership about the performance of procurement, you know, just give them all some cheap uniforms to wear. And then, and that, you know, <laughs> that really affects, for me, that affects the rest of procurement's ability to to add value because those perceptions that come from, you know, individual buys affect how people see procurement as a whole. So if you don't get it right. Well, even better than that, Phil, besides, besides giving them cheap uniforms to wear, you know, um, give them, give them those cheap uniforms and then, you know, tell them they're, they're going to get a weekly inventory delivered each week, but, but the following week uh, bring them only three of the five that yeah. they need for that work week. <laughs> and leave them too short and leave them washing their own clothes at home or, or wearing dirty clothes again yeah. for a second straight day. Uh, leave them with clothing that isn't getting repaired adequately, right. uh, that, that but buttons are falling off and not being replaced. I mean, all of these, there are so many headaches that are dealt with by the end user when uh, the supplier isn't living up to, um, you know, to, to the service level expectations. And, and, you know, all this stuff certainly is, is critical to, um, to the overall management of the category. Now, now, you mentioned earlier that this was never really a category where, you know, the, the best, the, the, the highest value, the best gains, you know, the most sustainable impact is gained by going off and, you know, running an RFP and just competing everybody against each other on price. Um, but, you know, maybe the market conditions masked the success of some of those tactics um, when it was an industry where pricing was flat or was trending downwards. So as we're kind of looking at a different environment for uniforms right now, what are some of the the levers, um, tactics, strategies that you would recommend anybody kind of follow to get the best out of the uniforms category? Well, you know, and I, I want to be clear, it's not that an RFP or, or some form of an of, of an, an open market process mm -hmm. can't bear fruit. Yeah. It can. It's just and and by now, you know, multiple years into this new landscape, this post Cintas G and K acquisition landscape, we are finding that 
that uh, more and more of our clients' baseline run rates are reflective of this new environment. So, um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of that new reality is settling yeah. into yeah. where the opportunities for savings are indeed there again. But, you know, the the problem is for somebody who who owns maybe 50 million a year in indirect spend and uniforms is two and a half of that 50. Um, you know, we're talking about 5% of that, that buyer's fear of responsibility. Uh, you know, theoretically one would hope that that buyer spends no more than a couple hours a week on mm -hmm. uniform. Um, I mean, to give you like, just even getting that buyer to the point where they feel they are, they have, created a baseline of what their company is doing today that has integrity um, is, is so incredibly challenging and usually flawed that just even getting to the point where a buyer actually feels equipped to utilize the open market is hard enough, um, you know, let alone going out and actually undertaking the open market exercise, creating apples to apples comparisons that have integrity. I'll give you an example. We have, um, I have a, uh, a client that years back asked me before they became a client, they said, Rich, what's a good price for a shop towel? You know, and this mm -hmm. is one of the, the industry washes towels in addition to uniforms and towels and floor mats and various other facility services products. And I said to him, Dave, the way you asked me that question shows me how badly you need us. Mm -hmm. I said, before I could even begin to answer your question, what's a good price for a shop towel? I've got to ask you probably a dozen different questions. What are you doing with them? What size do you need? What color do you need? First wash towers, towels. How does your supplier define the word inventory? Here's an interesting note. The industry three leading national suppliers don't even agree on what the definition of the word inventory is and the ripple effect implications of their disparate definitions of right. that word are too many for me to enumerate in this discussion, but but there's a massive spider out and spidering ripple effect of just the differing definitions of the word inventory, ranging from the weekly count on your shelf to a circulating inventory. Does your supplier impose an automatic replacement system? At what percentage? What's the replacement value per towel? This is all literally like questions that need to be asked yeah. related to that single line item for shop towels. <laughs> They're rest assured. You can go down a similar rabbit hole for almost every line item on the invoice that is presented to you by your uniform rental supplier, which when you back out at some point as a buyer, I would imagine you're asking yourself, well, what am I doing? <laughs> How much time am I going to spend trying to master this incredibly right. complex category that right. represents single digit percentage of my, of my responsibility. So yeah, it's, it's a conundrum. I, I can't claim, you know, I, I have a client in the rail industry who told us years ago, he said, and then he said, uh, we're happy to meet you guys because he said, I, I have, um, we kind of reached a point where we made a business decision to just not mess with this category. We left it in the hands of our field mm -hmm. and the, the, the calculus was, this is going to take more time than it's worth. We, you know, we are. And even once we get there, let's say we get there and we feel we have a good handle on it and we're prepared, you know, to use the market effectively from a corporate standpoint, we can't get our field to all agree on a course of action anyway. <laughs> they're, 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 even once we, we've got a good idea, we can't get buy-in on it. So it's, it's a maddening category for sure. So it sounds like it's a pretty complex category, you know, lots of uh, permutations and um, you know, for everything that you buy, because you know, you buy uniforms, you're not buying a single uniform, obviously, you're buying what can I imagine be hundreds or thousands of different line items. So what do you recommend for, um, for people that you work with that you talk to that you help on a daily basis? How do they really approach the category? What, what kind of mindset do you need to take? Well, to be clear, I think of our clients as really smart people that know more than we do about, you know, 47 of the 50 <laughs> expenses they've ever managed. Yeah. The one common thread with all of them, because you're right, it is such a complex category. The one common thread is always that no matter how much they had learned about the uniform rental space, and some of them had maybe managed five or six contract processes through the years, there were always a good healthy handful of unknown unknowns lurking beneath the surface and the industry suppliers are really good at exploiting those unknown 
unknown to the tune of surprising levels of profitability. If I had a client that had maybe gotten 95% of a previous contract, you know, just about optimal, that 5% that they missed was likely costing the company 20 to 25% yeah. in terms of hard dollar cost because of the ways those gaps had been exploited. And so, um, you know, I would say having a certain humility about the, the likelihood that there are many unknown unknowns <laughs> that just, you know, haven't come to the surface yet uh, in a particular buyer's career or experience with the category. I mean, that's, that's critical. Um, you know, in terms of what we recommend and how best to go about managing the category, certainly, you know, getting your hands on good data, um, and, uh, which is not necessarily readily provided by your suppliers is generally a movement throughout the industry to showing less in the invoicing. So, uh, you know, knowing what to ask for and getting uh, data that gives you the information you need to truly create um, a baseline with integrity is vital. Um, you know, setting a strategy uh, that that draws a roadmap to getting to optimal while balancing that path to optimal cost levels with a uh, an, an appropriate level of deference to the biases of your field personnel, making mm -hmm. sure that you don't do things that are going to be politically unpopular is critical, making sure that you've got alignment between procurement operations um, and even ultimately accounting, because, you know, when we get to finally implementing the results of whatever open market activities, direct negotiations with an incumbent, an RFP, whatever might happen um, in going and pursuing the cost saving strategy in, the, you know, that we've, we've all agreed upon at the outset, um, you know, when that's done and new deals are implemented, Accounting is going to play a critical role here because um, if you think it's just as simple as signing the deal and moving on with your life and assuming that you will get what you sign up for, um, you probably haven't spent much time with this category. Just you know, to 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 put a bow on that, you know, our firm has spent a pile of time and money through the years developing a proprietary software application built around uh, auditing and and managing uh, the expense. We've built the application around the characteristics of all the leading industry suppliers, their, their invoicing uh, characteristics. And we did not uh, we did not spend that time and money just for fun. Uh, we spent it because there's a real need. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't know um, that that it's it's possible to really effectively manage the category without a certain level of expertise and tools. Um, but the the one thing I would say above all else is making sure that there is alignment between procurement operations and accounting, because when the ink dries on a deal, however good or bad that deal is, uh, it's just critical to know you can't just throw that contract over the wall and hope that it plays out the way mm -hmm. it's supposed to. Um, there are so many factors that erode even the best efforts of the best procurement with this category um, that it's, uh, it's just utterly critical that operations and accounting also be a part of the, a part of the overall expense management strategy. What kind of pitfalls do you find, you know, in post sourcing? So you mentioned there about the struggles when you go live that, you know, doing the sources is, is only the part of the equation. And, um, you know, you, we see this with a lot of things where perhaps we hand over a category to a business owner. Um, and you know, that's can sometimes be where some of the difficulties begin because we just, there's not the oversight or the governance on the contract or perhaps some of the things that were negotiated aren't actually implementable for whatever reason within the culture of the company that you work for. So what are the big kind of pitfalls or, or things to avoid or things to at least take into consideration post contract that you see? Yeah. It to, to avoid them is almost impossible, I would say. I think there are certain just realities of when you're entering into three to five year agreements for a service that is so fluid and involves, you know, product coming and going week after week that involves uh, frequently safety, that involves marketing. Um, the landscape is never going to be completely static. So I think first and foremost, you know, new product additions is, is at the at the top of the list of, you know, factors that erode the efforts of procurement after the deal gets done. Uh, if you want to liken the category in this way to MRO supplies, for example, mm -hmm. um, we did an audit project a few years back for a client that three years prior had signed a really great national uh, contract for their uniform services. And believe it or not, for 
um, the product that they had contemplated in that process, um, the agreement was still compliant in their invoicing, and they um, they had just done a great job on on that that deal. And unfortunately, that deal represented 37% of their spend. (laughs) The other 63% was Mm -hmm. stuff that had been added since the deal got done. And for that 63%, they were getting a really bad deal. And at the end of the day, this customer found themselves 40 plus percent a field from optimal market cost levels. So yeah, new product addition is is huge. But, um, you know, you're never going to be able to totally prevent that. Sometimes your safety requirements may change. and, And so... You know, certain people have to be put in a different level of flame resistant clothing, for example, mm-hmm. um, and, or maybe they need high visibility striping applied to their uniforms and you're forced to, you know, to change uh, to new products midstream during the course of a contract. Now, it's critical on the front end to properly address a protocol for these such you know, scenarios yeah. um, that, that will inevitably arise during your agreement. But then also just making sure you actually adhere to the protocol when it happens. Mm-hmm. Usually when, when these changes occur, you know, people's hair is on fire. They're realizing, hey, we need, yeah. we need this done yesterday. Yeah. And the buyer is dealing from a position of weakness. And so, you know, having the right terms, but then adhering to good process as these events play out is critical. This is what, I mean, we use our software in these areas uh, extensively, you know, to, to identify when a new product uh, that is not contemplated in your invoicing hits your uh, or excuse me, that is not contemplated in your contract hits your invoicing right away and getting on that immediately. Hey, is this a product we want? Is this a product we need? What is the appropriate price for this product before that starts mushrooming out into becoming 63% of your spend three years later? Um, you know, having a protocol and then um, acting on it um, as it happens uh, during the course of your agreement is critical. But there are many others. I mean, let's, let's face it, at, at, at its core, We're talking about a proposition where week in, week out, there is product leaving your plant and product coming in. The person bringing the product in is a commissioned route person. That person enters your facility armed with a pre-printed invoice and a pen. Okay. And that pen, the the, the pen is mightier than the sword. Uh, That pen uh, has the ability to launch an attack on your bottom line uh, each and every week as additional charges are added to the invoice, yeah. loss charges, ruin charges, um, various other peripheral fees associated with the expense. So, I mean, it's, there's an ongoing joust. And the, the, the challenge for our clients that I'm seeing is just that in this era of ultra lean expense management function, expense management departments, the resources simply aren't there right. to, to effectively engage in the joust week after week. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a maddening expense, as I've stated before, and, and um, you know, one that certainly uh, is a, a bane on bottom lines uh, <laughs> throughout our client's yeah. experience, at least. Well, Rich, I want to thank you so much just for joining me today to talk a little bit about uniforms and kind of open, I, I want to say, peel back the onion, if you will, into both some of the challenges but opportunities in managing this. As you say, my experience has been it's, it's a category that um, – is often one that we don't necessarily have the ability to dig really deep into, um, but also one that can have a really big impact on the perception of procurement and and ultimately the negative uh, perception of procurement. So it's an important one, I think, to be in control of. So if folks um, uh, who've enjoyed the the podcast today uh, would like to learn a little bit more about uh, uniforms themselves, the uniform category, but also just connect with you personally, what would be the best place for them to go and do that? FineTuneUS.com. Uh, FineTuneUS.com is the site. Uh, find us on LinkedIn as well, FineTune. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll be uh, excited to hear from, from any of your, uh, your listeners that want to learn more. Awesome. Well, I will include links to your website, to your LinkedIn page on our show notes page that accompanies this podcast. That's going to be available. Just go to artofprocurement.com slash podcast. You'll find all of our recent uh, interviews there. So artofprocurement.com slash podcast. You'll find links to the Fine Tune website, to Rich's LinkedIn profile. Um, Yep, check it out. Well, Rich, before we go, one last time, I want to just thank you very much for joining me today. Appreciate it, Phil. I really enjoyed it. Happy to come back anytime. 
Hi there, I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalogue at artofprocurement.com slash podcast, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer, or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow, and if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it.